What's cracking YouTube? Come on, come all. Welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. Ooh, did you just hear that rhyme? Come on, come all, welcome back to Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. That's a million dollar rhyme right there. Um, as always, it's your boy Nick. We're diving right back into the AFC North with another team outlook, the Pittsburgh Steelers, backed by popular demand. I also put out the Cleveland Brown ones this morning, or today, actually at the exact same time. So if you didn't catch that one, you can also get that up on the channel. If you're looking for a specific team, just hit up my search bar on my channel, type in that team, and within that team, you'll find any player that's kind of fantasy relevant. And real quick, I've mentioned this before, but I am working on a draft guide coming out somewhere from early to mid-August, which will be like an e-magazine, a PDF that you could download. It'll have my top 250 rankings, along with Sleepers Bus, a bunch of other shit that you can get. A one-stop shop, basically. So stay looking out for that, and I'll let you guys know more about it. But without further ado, let's get into the team from Pittsburgh. I'm gonna just come out and say this. Ben Roethlisberger is an overhyped fantasy quarterback every single year. It happened again last year. Last year I had Breeze listed as my most undervalued quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger as my, vote, my most overvalued quarterback going into the year. Spot on with both of them. He's going at pick 110 overall, quarterback 11 right now. I want you to listen to his fantasy quarterback finishes since and starting with 2010. Quarterback 17, quarterback 13, quarterback 18, Quarterback 12, quarterback 5, quarterback 20, quarterback 18 last year. So him finishing in that, that number 5 spot back in 2014 is really keeping them owners coming back. On a points per game basis, he usually is flirting within the top 13 to 15 rankings. That being said, he's only played a full 16 games in three of his career 13 seasons. So that, that doesn't really help him when he's injured all the time. What I want to kind of get across as my points here are a couple splits that we have that are going to be kind of crucial to this this season. The first of which is his home versus away splits. I'm sure you've heard this stat before about how bad he is on the road and how much better he is at home, right? Here they are. And this is from 2014 to 2016, so the last three seasons, right? You see 20 games at home, 22 away. The fantasy points are just absurd. It's a 13-point difference on, at home versus on the road. He averages 70 yards passing more per game, uh, 1.8 passing touchdowns per game more. So basically he goes from like a top eight, top five fantasy quarterback at home to a lower quarterback two on the road. And you know, when you pick your quarterback, you want someone with more consistency, you want someone you can count on. Cause you know, it's easy to just be like, oh, you know what, I'll just start him for all my home games, I'll start him for all my away games, I'll bench him for all my away games, but then, what happens at that one home game where he doesn't do well, right? That screws you for like three weeks at a time. You don't want that in your quarterback. The second split I do want you to be aware of is Roethlisberger with and without Martavis Bryant over the last three years also. So, I mean, it's no secret that a guy like Martavis Bryant, his talent, his skill set is going to boost any quarterback and their stats. And you could see he's, he's played 19 games out of a possible 42 with Bryant. And in those games, he's averaged four points more per game. So that's 100 yards or that's an extra passing touchdown. They throw the ball more when he's in the game. He's just a much better quarterback when Martavis is in the game, which makes sense given that Martavis is really good at spreading the field, right? He gets guys like Antonio Brown open more. He opens up the running lanes. All that kind of stuff is, is into play. So we know that he's great at home. He's shitty on the road. He's great when he's with Martavis. He's not so good without Martavis. So it's kind of a tricky situation. It's, it's one of those where he's not a guy I want as my quarterback one because there's so many different variables to him being good and him not being good. Whereas you can get a quarterback one that's usually giving you a pretty safe floor. I got this stat from Matt Barry who does like his 100 statistics you need to know going into this, the next season. And this one says, Ben had as many games with fewer than 190 passing yards than he did with more than 300 passing yards. So his floor is low, his ceiling can be high. Uh, you just really never know what you're going to get there. I don't know. Big Ben, I'm off Big Ben. I mean, it's worth noting that he will be thrown behind a really good offensive line. They are, I think, the fourth ranked pass blocking line, according to Football Outsiders. They are returning all five starters. So that's obviously upside for Ben, but he's going around where guys like Marcus Mariota, Kirk Cousins, even Dak Prescott, uh, around that draft area, and I would probably rank Ben last out of all those guys. I just think you could find more consistency and more upside. 
with other players. So since we were talking about Martavis, we'll, we'll jump right into it, right? He missed the entire 2016 season. Now, reports this offseason have been great. You know, Ben Roethlisberger said he looks like a stud. He should jump right back into that role. He should have no problem beating out uh, Juju Smith-Schuster. Jesus Christ, that name is hard to pronounce. Sammy Coates for outside reps and stuff like that. A couple stats to throw out here. So Martavis Bryant has played at least 50% of the snaps 15 times in his career. His total receiving line in those games in which he played 50% or more of the snaps, 73 catches, 1,209 yards, 10 touchdowns. So that's 15 games, not even a full season. Crazy numbers. And that's in 20, I don't know, I found different sites had him playing 21 games and different, another site had him playing 22 games. I'm not really sure what that was about. But either way, he's played around 21 or 22 career games, right? He scored in his third 15 touchdowns in that limited size. He brings a crazy dimension that you're not going to get with a lot of NFL players. He has really good size as well as really good speed and he can run after the catch. You don't get a combination of those three things with a lot of players in the NFL. In those two seasons he played, 2014 and 2015, he was wide receiver 15 on a points per game basis. The high points per game came at a cost of consistency though too. So in, in nine of 21 or 22 career games, Bryant finished as wide receiver 40 or worse. So right now he's going at pick 47 overall, wide receiver 24, right? It's definitely a huge risk, but also comes with a huge upside. He hasn't played since 2015. I will say though, he's wide receiver 24 right now. If, if reports keep coming out about how good he's looked this offseason, I think he's going to creep into, you know, the lower 20s, maybe like 21, um, something around there. If he gets into like 20 or anywhere near the teens, I'm staying away from him. So like I said, he was... Wide receiver 15 on a points per game basis, and you're not gonna get much more production than you did at it in those games, because he was so good. He will never be the wide receiver one in this offense with Antonio Brown there. So if you're gonna pick him as like wide receiver 18 or 19, and he's scoring as wide receiver 15 on a points per game basis, there's not a lot of room for error there. So if he doesn't live up to that points per game number, there's a lot of room for risk, right? For, for something not to break right, not to break in his favor, right? Between suspension, between him not playing in a full year, like, I don't know. So at wide receiver 24, I don't think it's a problem, but if he keeps creeping up the ADP, I won't be risking it to have him on my team. I don't need to waste your time with Antonio Brown. He's my number three overall ranked player in fantasy football this year, regardless of format. And I had him there before we even heard anything about Zeke getting a suspension. If you're worried about if his usage is gonna go down with Martavis Bryant in the lineup, don't be. Here are some splits. He's actually way better with Martavis Bryant in the lineup. That makes sense because Martavis opens the field very wide for a guy like Antonio Brown. Not a lot of double coverage, not a lot of safeties over the top because they have to worry about both guys. So if that was a concern of yours, it shouldn't be. Move past Brown, move past Bryant, the double Bs, right? Shout out my ex-girlfriend. You get to Eli Rogers, you get to rookie Juju Smith-Schuster. These two are basically gonna battle it out for the slot and uh, who's gonna be the fourth wide receiver in four wide receiver sets. Now, we look at Eli Rogers, we got a pretty good sample size of him last year, right? 48 catches, 593 yards, three touchdowns, nothing anywhere near impressive considering they basically had next to nothing at tight end and Martavis Bryant wasn't in the lineup. I do think for continuity purposes and just lack of experience, he beats Smith Schuster out for that job. He's just 20 years young. He was stupidly productive at USC, right? And it's a the reason they used a second round pick on the kid. When I dove into Matt Harmon's reception perception, we kind of get a different story about, I'm just calling him JJ, JSS, Juju, Juju double S. Juju 2XS, I don't know how that, does that make sense? Whatever. When you dove into the report, it basically said he had a lot of trouble separating from defensive backs. He was in the bottom 33, 33rd percentile, which is not good. You know, that's a skill that you need to be able to kind of conquer if you're gonna be a good NFL prospect. I mean, they have him working with the twos for the most part as wide receiver four in these OTAs and minicamp and stuff. They do have him working with the first team in, uh, in the red zone area. He's 6'1", 215, so he's got good size. It's possible that they, you know, they choose to use him the, down in that area in 2017. But regardless of who wins the jobs, Rodgers or Smith-Schuster, I can't really see them playing a big role fantasy-wise because they're going to be the fourth, possibly fifth option in the passing game because you already have Le'Veon Bell, obviously, Antonio Brown, Martavis Bryant. We'll see what they do at tight end if Jesse James plays a role, but I, I don't really see either of them putting up consistent enough numbers to make an impact. And then behind them, it goes even deeper. Darius Hayward Bay and Sammy Coates, the last remaining wideouts on the Steelers. 
Uh, Hayward Bay should make the team. He's been a pretty constant there for the last couple of years. Coates is recovering from off-season groin surgery, and reports say that he's going to need to compete for a roster spot. I don't, I don't think that's true. He, he took a pretty nice sophomore leap last year. He averaged 20.7 yards per catch on 21 catches, so really good yardage given the small amount of usage he had there. So I, I, they have a very deep receiving core, but I don't see much value behind the top two guys. And then you move over to tight end where we have Jesse James. He is the definition of just a guy. He played in all 16 games last year, managed only to post 39 catches, 338 yards, three touchdowns, finishing as tight end 43 on a points per game basis. I mean, there is reason, I guess, for optimism here. He's just 23 years old. Uh, Big Ben says he really likes James, and the two have been working a lot, like extra work in the red zone area down by the goal line. So it's possible that he sees some red zone targets there. He tied Antonio Brown for the team lead in targets inside the 10 with seven, but I think that changes with the return of Martavis Bryant. And when I was looking at the splits again for guys that played with Martavis and without him, Jesse James was basically the only player that did worse with Martavis in the lineup than without him in the lineup which is a red flag for me. I mean, as a starting tight end, it's likely that he, he returns value to you. He's getting picked at tight end 25 right now. So he'll probably return value. But that being said, like, do you want a tight end 17 on your roster? Probably not. Which leads us to the backfield. Even with the injury risk, Le'Veon Bell is my number one overall player in fantasy football this year. He's in a contract dispute with the Steelers. He wants a long-term deal. Obviously, they don't see the running back position as that much of, of a value play. They don't value it that much, but the holdout's not expected to impact at all his his uh, his regular season. He said he plans to play all 16 games, even if he is franchi well, he's franchise tag. So I'm not worried about his in-season, which honestly might be a good thing considering his injury history and his usage over the last year or so. He's only played in 18 games over the last two seasons, um, but he has his upside as a fantasy player is all time, right? Could be the best running back we've seen at least in the last 10 to 20 years. In just 12 games last year, Bell touched the ball 336 times. That's 28 touches a game. I mean, honestly, it probably should be scaled back a little bit so we don't get hurt, but he's entering his 25 year old season. That's like prime time running back, right? 25, 26, 27. So I don't really expect that usage to be scaled back at all. And even if he goes from 28.6 down to 22, 25, Bell getting 22 to 25 touches is still arguably the best running back in fantasy football. What's even better, as I touched on before, they have one of the best offensive lines in the NFL. They were ranked second best run blocking line by Football Outsiders. They are the third ranked line by Pro Football Focus entering 2017. And it says if it was based on the last nine games of 2016, they would have been number one overall. And they're returning all five starters this year. And I promise this is the last time I'll bring these splits up. If you're worried about Bell's usage while Martavis Bryant is playing, don't be. Averages more fantasy points when Bryant is on the field than when he is not on the field. What I do think is cool is if Bell does hold out for the summer, we get a better look at James Conner, the third round rookie out of Pittsburgh. Great story if you want to go read that shit. I'm not really about to talk about it, but James Conner should actually be the handcuff here. He should win that backup role for Le'Veon and could develop into a workhorse if an injury occurs or anything like that. So we get time to look at him, especially in the preseason. And, you know, it's good, Bell's franchise tag. So contract year for Bell, it's hard to tell at this point, but say, you know, the Steelers don't value the running back position that well. And for some reason, they let go of Le'Veon Bell. They don't want to pay him the 13, 14 million he wants, and another team would. Maybe Bell leaves and James Conner takes over that feature role. So definitely, definitely someone to keep an eye on in Dynasty and, uh, and even Keeper Leagues. If you're, if you're going to keep for one year, Conner could be that next guy in the immediate future. They also have uh, Fitzgerald Toussaint. Is it, is it Toussaint, one of my favorite desserts? But Connor basically makes him irrelevant. One last stat to leave you with, also worth noting, the Steelers went for two, two-point conversions on 32% of their scores, on 32% of their touchdowns last year, which was by far the most in the NFL. It's not like a huge deciding factor, but if you're in a tiebreaker with guys like Antonio Brown or Martavis Bryant or even Le'Veon Bell, that could be the deciding factor for you. And, which way to swing things because you get a lot more opportunity. Two more points here, two more points there might add up. And I want to leave you with a question. Choose one option. If you had to take the quarterback, running back, wide receiver from either of these teams, who would it be? Would you rather have Ben, Martavis Bryant, and Le'Veon Bell or Palmer, David Johnson, Larry Fitzgerald? I'm not throwing Antonio Brown in there because obviously that'd make it cheap, but 
Who would you rather have if you could have if you if you had to have either of those three on one of your team? You have to choose either the Cardinals three or the Steelers three. I'm assuming like 90% of you guys are gonna go with the Steelers, but who knows? And that's it. I appreciate y'all watching. Uh, go follow me on Twitter. Give it that thumbs up if you enjoyed, please. And we'll be coming at you with the next two AFC North teams on Tuesday. Because we're doing Team Alec Tuesday, Team Alec Thursday until we wrap up all the divisions. Peace.